Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the video uh, for the PowerPoint for chapter three. So again, these are just summary videos, kind of giving you the highlights. Uh, what are we looking at here? The balance sheet and financial disclosures, okay? So uh, when we talk about the balance sheet, right, we're really talking about you know, our assets equal our liabilities plus stockholders equity, right? And really what this is looking at is the financial position at a point in time, right? So it's like, hey, where are we as of this date, right? That's like a balance sheet. Whereas an income statement is more looking for a period of time, right? What were our revenues and expenses um, for the last six months? So balance sheet is more like a, a wall posting on like a Facebook or Instagram or something. Whereas like this would be your entire sort of wall, right? The income statement showing everything. Uh, right, so there, there you can see, right, there would be like your total assets equal your total liabilities plus your total uh, shareholders equity. That's great. A um, few things here. Why do we care about the balance sheet, right? Well, you got to step in the shoes of the investors, right? Imagine you're like a shark on Shark Tank. What are you getting at? Or when you say, can you please show me the balance sheet? What are they trying to see? Well, things like liquidity, right? Uh, in other words, uh, anytime we say the word liquidity in accounting, we mean how quickly can we convert something to cash? Is this uh, business like liquid or illiquid, right? Um, so cash is like super liquid, right? Gold is very liquid. A short-term stock is very liquid. That'd be very easy to convert that to cash. Uh, where like PP&E, right? If you have a building, that may take like months before you can sell that thing and get the cash from it, Okay. Uh, next thing here is solvency, right? Uh, is this company, do I want to put my company, my money in a company that can pay its debts? Um, and sort of the, what goes hand in hand in that is financial flexibility, right? Are they going to be jammed up on like all the stuff they owe that if a good opportunity comes along, uh, they'll miss it, right? They're not going to be able to take it. So these are things we look at, we assess when we're looking at a balance sheet. Uh, there are some limitations, with the balance sheet, right? The biggest one here is historical cost, right? The general rule when you look at the balance sheet is that things are gonna be recorded on there for what you paid for them, uh, not what they're currently worth, right? So if we have a building on there, uh, it may show you know $100,000, but hey, maybe housing prices have really gone up. And if we were to sell that right now, we could get a million. Right. So it, we look on there, it's 100, but it's really worth a million. So that disconnect. Right. That's like one of the limitations with the balance sheet. Um, there are times we depart from historical costs. Right. It has a mixed attribute model, but um, that's one idea with it. Also, the balance sheet doesn't capture everything. Right. Not everything is recorded on there. Uh, hey, maybe we have really good employees or maybe there's other kind of factors or things on there. Uh, that can't be shown in dollar amounts, okay? So internal to the assets equal liabilities and stockholders equity, there's kind of sub-accounts, right? So it's like you have your currents, your long-terms, and in your stockholders equity, you have your stock, your paid-in capital, and your retained earnings. So we're going to talk about these guys here. Uh, so this is just saying, hey, what's a subclassification? Current assets, uh, the other thing to be aware of here and what we're going to start our discussion on with assets, right? So we're going to talk about the current assets and the long-term assets. And depending on which textbook you use, uh, they could use different terminology, right? Sometimes they use long-term, sometimes they use non-current assets. It really means the same thing. Uh, that is to say, are these assets, right, expected to be converted into cash or are we going to use them? within the next year or the operating cycle, whatever is longer, right? So first off, what does that mean? We know there's kind of this like, test here that tells, if it's, tells us if it's current or non-current. The first thing is you need to know the operating cycle, right? This is the cash to cash cycle. And it basically says, how long does it take us from when we spend our first dollar in our business to on the flip side, when we get our first dollar from selling the goods to the customers? 
right? So maybe we're a cookie company, right? We buy a KitchenAid mixer on day one. And then uh, three days later, we make our first sale, right? So in that case, our operating cycle would be like three days, right? Uh, what they say here in the current ask te test is you compare the operating cycle with one year, right? Here, the bigger is one year, right? That's like way bigger than three days. That's the line of demarcation for if it's a current asset or not. In other words, if we plan on basically using this within the window, it's a current asset. If not, it's non-current. Um, and whenever they say what is longer, right, sometimes the operating cycle can be uh, bigger than uh, the one year mark, right? So here it's three days. Imagine we were a shipbuilding company. Right. If you're building the Titanic, it may take several years before you uh, you know, get your first fleet of customers. So in that case, uh, yeah, you could have and is it possible to have uh, an asset that you expect to use in the next two years? And it's a current asset. Uh, well, yes, if the operating cycle is like bigger than that. Right. So you look and basically what you want to do is map out what's the operating cycle, what's one year. Right. In this case, the bigger is one year. That's the winner. Do we use it in there? It's current. If the first was the winner, that would be the line of demarcation. Right. If it was like three years versus one year, well, then that would tell us if we use it in that window, if it's current. So when we look at the balance sheet, right, and current assets, they're listed in order of liquidity, right, from most to least liquid. And it kind of follows this general theme and uh, how it goes here. But the idea, like we said, with liquidity is how quickly can you convert this to cash, right? Obviously, cash is the most liquid. Then you'd have your short-term investments, accounts receivable, inventory, and your prepaids, right? So there you can see that on there. Uh, one thing to be aware of when we talk about cash, right, when you see that on the balance sheet, right, cash and cash equivalents, it's cash and cash equivalents, right? So it's like cash plus a little bit more, right? When we say that plus, right, it's all of these basically cash equivalents, things like commercial paper, money market funds, treasury bills, things that we uh, think from the date of purchase uh, basically have an original maturity of three months. In other words, this is de facto cash, right? If you have money, in a money market fund, you might as well just call that cash. Uh, next, like when you're looking at current assets, you'd see your short term investments, right? You really, a lot of the things uh, that with these, you have to look at the intent, right? What does the uh, company plan to do? Uh, and whenever we have these, right, your short term investments, you can categorize them as held to maturity, trading, or available. Uh, for sale, right? Uh, and there's different kind of uh, items and why we care about that. Uh, we'll talk about that at a later point in time. I'm just kind of giving you a high level overview here. All right, next up, we have our receivables. Remember, receivables are assets. Payables are liabilities, right? So you'll have your accounts receivable, your notes receivable. Essentially, someone comes in they buy from us and they say, we will pay you later, right? So we're the business and we have somebody who's going to pay us later. That's a receivable. Uh, if it's a sale on account, it's an account receivable. If it's more of a long-term item there, it would be a note receivable. What's the difference between them, right? Account versus note. Well, it really is how formal is it as well as whether we charge interest, right? So an account receivable may be, hey, you owe us 100 bucks. They're going to pay us the 100 bucks. The note receivable may be, hey, you owe us 100 bucks. Uh, when you come to pay us, you got to pay the 100 plus $10 of interest, right? whatever the terms and conditions are for that interest. Likewise, you'll see inventory as a current asset, right? So when you have inventory, you got to kind of break that out between your raw materials, your whip, and your finished goods. You'll learn more about that in your cost accounting class. Likewise, 
you'll also see prepaid expenses, right? So this is kind of a trick. It says expense, but it's really an asset, right? And the idea with this is we pay for it before we're going to use it, right? So it would be like prepaid rent, right? We pay for our rent uh, ahead of time or prepaid insurance. We pay it right here, right? Cash outflow, but we only, and to the extent we start using it, we take that expense, right? So we kind of tee it up as an asset, as a prepaid, and then when we use it, we expense it. Okay, MCQ, you can look at that there. Next, let's talk a little bit about long-term assets, right? So these are generally going to be uh, more than that one-year mark or operating cycle, whatever's longer. Uh, you can look at these down here, right? We're going to talk about them. The big one is PP&E, right? Property, plant, and equipment. That's what you'll traditionally see in there, as well as some intangibles. Uh, so when we're talking about kind of our non-current or long-term assets, one of the things you can have in there are investments, right? Um, again, we have that kind of one-year mark here. Uh, these are going to be the assets that are not used directly in the operations of the investment or of the business. Uh, they could be things like investments in equity or debt of other corporations, land held for speculation, cash set aside for special purposes. Again, all of these are kind of investments that we're making that are more long-term. We're not going to you know, plan on selling these things in the next year. All right, PP&E, right? We had it first in accounting. Maybe COVID brought it up with you know, medical face masks and stuff, but we had it first. Uh, the idea with this is this is like your buildings, right? Your equipment, your long-term stuff. Uh, and when you put it on the balance sheet, it's going to be cost, right? Maybe we paid a hundred bucks, right? Cost, you got to back out any accumulated depreciation, right? Maybe there's $20 of accumulated depreciation. And then that will get you your net book value, right? So that's what they're saying when we carry it on there uh, for that amount. Intangibles, right? Intangibles are non-physical assets, uh, right? And uh, what are some examples, right? It might be like a patent, a copyright, a trademark, a franchise. These are presented similarly uh, to PP&E in the sense that you net them uh, of accumulated amortization. So what's going on here? A physical property you depreciate, right? So it's cost minus accumulated depreciation gets you carrying value. Intangible property you amortize. So it's going to be uh, basically your what you're carrying it at minus that accumulated amortization that gives you and how you will report it on the balance sheet. Other long-term assets. Right, you can look at these things like long-term operating leases, long-term prepaids, just kind of like a catch-all there. Some MCQs, right? I'm not gonna you know kind of spend too much time on those because this is summary video, so you can you know look at the PowerPoint yourself. Uh, let's talk a little bit about liabilities, right? Um, when we have liabilities, right, we also break these out between current liabilities and long-term liabilities or non-current liabilities. Uh, and essentially what are liabilities, right? Uh, or how do we kind of start with this with our currents, right? So these are obligations that are expected to be satisfied through the use of current assets or the creation of other current liabilities specifically expected to be satisfied within one year or the operating cycle whatever is longer, right? So what they're really saying here is like, are we planning on paying this in the next year, right? Like, uh, is this due next month or is this due in five years from now? Okay, so what are some examples of current liabilities? You got your payables, your deferred revenues, your accrued liabilities in the current portion of long-term debt. Okay, so let's talk about payables, right? Payables are liabilities. Remember, receivables are assets, payables are liabilities. This is the flip side, right? This is when you walk into the store 
and you say, I will pay you later. You're not the business. I mean, you are the business in the sense that you're doing the financials, but essentially when you're the business and you're buying something from another business, you say, I'll pay you later. And normally when you make a, a purchase or a sale on account, that pay you later is going to be somewhere in the range of 30 to 60 days. Again, we have the distinction here between account and note payable. Uh, the difference there, again, as we said, will be interest. All right, then we have our deferred revenues and our accrued liabilities. So again, this is kind of the flip side. Uh, with re deferred revenues, this is where we get the money first, uh, but we only recognize the revenue later, right? It's deferred. We kind of kick the can until a later point in time. So this would be like a sale of a gift card, right? Uh, somebody comes into the business, they buy the gift card. Uh, we're a pizza business. Hey, we aren't going to recognize revenue when we get the money for accrual purposes. We're going to recognize it whenever we provide the service, right? We give them the pizza six months later, or whenever they use that gift card, right? So it could be gift cards. It could be prepaid rent in the sense that our uh, customer or our tenant prepays us. We're not the one doing the prepay. Uh, tickets, right? Maybe we're a football team or something and uh, somebody, maybe we're the Steelers, right? Or we're the football team, right? And they, they uh, our customers buy their season tickets in advance, right? That's going to be deferred revenue until we have the performance or the game, right? Next one here are our accrued liabilities, right? So uh, these essentially are going to be the flip side, right? This is whenever we have the expense in the period, but we only pay it later, right? So we have uh, recognition first, cash second, whereas up here it's cash first, recognition second. So what's going on here? This is things like, it's mostly payables, right? So things like, hey, our employees worked during the period. Here we are at the end of the period. We got to do that AJE to accrue the salary expense, right? We'll do debit salary expense, credit, salary payable. Well, hey, that salary payable is going to be a current liability. We plan on paying it you know, within the next year, generally. Uh, next, the current portion of long-term debt. So this is exactly uh, as it has here, right? So say we have a long-term debt, like a note, a loan, a mortgage, Whatever is due right within the next year, if that's you know the litmus test, right, that's going to be current liability, whereas the remainder is long term, right? So we owe a million on a note, right? A hundred is due this year, current liability, namely the current portion of long term debt, and the remainder will be a long term liability. Um, you can read this here, right? When you have long-term liabilities, be aware of like the terms, the conditions, the interest uh, that's associated with it. Again, in a couple uh, MCQs here. Uh, next, let's look at shareholders equity, right? So we said that this is basically broken out between your stock, right? Your paid in capital and your retained earnings, okay? Uh, and sometimes it's known as like net assets or book value. Uh, it includes basically your equity components. And one thing we will look at is this AOCI, right? Accumulated other comprehensive income. That's like a more expansive version of retained earnings, right? So it's like retained earnings plus more in there. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go through. But let me kind of move this down here. Right, so here's stockholders equity, right? They're giving us 2019 and then 2020, right? They're giving us the common stock and the APIC. So there's the stock, there's the retained earnings, there's our AOCI, giving us our total stockholders equity. Uh, do be aware that there's some differences, right? Because we're talking about the balance sheet this week between how you do it for, uh, GAAP and IFRS, right? U.S. GAAP. So uh, a couple things here, right? Uh, international standards specify a minimum of items that have to be presented. GAAP doesn't have a minimum. Likewise, uh, in IFRS, 
right? They're generally going to call it the statement of financial position, not the balance sheet. And in IFRS, they go from non-current to current uh, on it. So what's an example here? If you pulled up a French company's balance sheet, right? First off, it wouldn't say balance sheet. It would say statement of financial position. If you were to look at the assets on that statement of financial position, it would go from long-term to short-term uh, with it. Gap is the reverse, right? Gap, we're starting from like short-term to long-term. So it kind of disorients you when you see a foreign financial statement for the first time. It's pretty much the same. Uh, obviously, there's the differences between Gap and IFRS, but the more you see them, the more comfortable you become with them. Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about disclosures, right? So as it has here at the end of each fiscal year, companies with public securities uh, are required to provide a shareholders with an annual report. If you're a big publicly traded company, right, this is normally your 10K, you do that once a year. Things you're gonna have in there are gonna be your uh, financial statements and then any additional disclosures. So, Let's talk a little bit about disclosures, right? Really what they're getting at here is uh, we want to include on top of the financial statements anything a reasonable third party would want to or should know about this company that isn't covered in the four corners of the balance sheet, the income statement, right? All those kind of documents. So things you may see disclosures about uh, are like pension plan, plans, long-term debt, income taxes. Uh, the other thing here is, right, when you have your disclosures, right, often they include the footnotes, the most important one is going to be the summary of significant accounting policies, right? If you will pull up any kind of 10K, right, the, this is always like the first footnote at the back. Uh, they also have like kind of subsequent events, related third-party transactions, but the big guy there is the summary of significant accounting policies. Um, and what does that say, right? The summary of significant accounting policies, right? It talks a lot about really how do we recognize revenue? How do we recognize expenses? How do we calculate depreciation, right? It's all of our underlying policies that tell us the rules, the processes, the procedures for how we completed these financial statements. Likewise, you may see uh, disclosures or footnotes about subsequent events, right? This is basically saying, hey, this is stuff, uh, right? Because maybe our balance sheet is for year one, right? Uh, but we prepare this report over here in year two. Uh, this is a subsequent event, right? It occurs after the fiscal year end, but before the financial statements, right? So if there's like some important thing that happens um, after the actual fiscal year end, but before we actually prepare this, that a reasonable third party would want to know, uh, then you got to disclose it, right? Hey, if the business is merging, right? You can't just like hide that. You're aware of that when you prepare this. So that would be a, a subsequent event. Uh, likewise, other things that you would want to see in there, uh, are related party transactions, errors or fraud, illegal acts, right? Obviously, the more these are things reasonable third parties would want to know, right? So these are kind of categories or uh, transactions. These are a little bit rarer, right? I mean, businesses aren't like, you know, nobody's like voluntarily being like, oh, we illegally did this. But uh, if you got caught, right, or there was like an Enron scandal or something big, right, that would, you know, once you're aware of it, um, knowingly or, you know, from a, a sort of a criminal prosecution, right? These are, uh, the, the overarching theme here is what would a reasonable third party want to know, an investor, right? So you can uh, look at that there, right? That's just saying, hey, uh, in the summary of significant accounting policies, you would probably disclose how we calculate depreciation. All right, MD&A, man management discussion and analysis. So this is kind of another part or item there, right? So this is really uh, in addition to the financial uh, statements in those notes, each annual report of a publicly traded company has to have the MD&A, right? So this is from management. It's really talking about what, it's kind of giving a story, 
to it, right? It's like, what were our operations? What's our liquidity? What are our capital resources? It's a little bit biased, right? In the sense that management is writing it, but it's almost like a little storybook that accompanies the financial statements. Normally you'll see it in like the front end, um, like associated with the balance sheet and, and things like that, the financial statements. So as I have here, right, or, you know, what's going on, it says management prepares this and it's responsible for the financial statements and other information. Uh, it asserts the responsibility of management for information contained in it. And it requires corporate executives to personally certify the financial statement. So a lot of these provisions were from Enron and kind of other early 2000s accounting scandals. Basically what happened there was uh, all the CEO, the CFO, they just buried their head in the sand and were like, yeah, we signed off on those financial statements, uh, but we really didn't know the specifics, right? And we're just like super high level. This now, right, what they're required to do post SOC, so, you know, a legal act, is they have to personally certify. They can't do that anymore and say, uh, you know, we weren't aware, right? That, that's not going to act as an excuse anymore. Uh, also, right, uh, other things that we would want to see or that would kind of be in there is compensation to directors and top executives, right? As I have here, a proxy statement must be provided to all the shareholders you know, with that annual report. It invites them right to the annual meeting where you can uh, elect the board members or vote on issues, uh, as well as it includes compensation and stock option information. Really what's going on here is, hey, if you own stock in a company, uh, you'll get a statement periodically once a year. Hey, we're having the annual meeting. It's time for you to vote for the board members. Uh, here's information about the compensation and, and other stock option information for our kind of top most important people. This one says, where is management's discussion and analysis uh, located, right? So MDA is going to be proceeding before the financial statements and audit report. So uh, it's kind of like you have the MD&A, uh, right? You have the financial statements, the audit report, and then you uh, have, you know, also in there, those kind of footnotes. Uh, sustainability disclosures. This is kind of an interesting growing field, right? Like depending if you're more left or right on the political spectrum, there's like less of a framework for this. There's like certain disclosures they have to make under like sort of minor federal law, but there's not as much regulation in this. This is kind of a too deep, to be determined area, how much you have to must disclose versus you want to do it because like you think it's the right thing to do as a business, right? So we're really talking about ESG, right? This is right down here, right? Environmental, social, and governance factors. What kind of things are we doing, you know, in the environment? How much coal are we producing? How much smoke are we putting into the atmosphere, um, right? What's our gender diversity, right? What's our um, CEO pay ratio? So these are things you would see uh, in this. And again, this is kind of a to be determined field in the sense that over the next 5, 10, 15 years, my guess, it, it depends, right? My guess would be is you're going to likely see more of this. There's pushback, like I'm somewhere in the middle on politics, but obviously Democrats prefer this and uh, Republicans do not like uh, ESG. They think that it's like an infusing of politics into business operations and they should be separate. So Again, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm just trying to tell you both sides so you have an understanding uh, of ESG. All right, the auditor's report, right? So we talked a little bit about this. Auditors, they're basically uh, hired to come and examine the financial statements, make sure they're accurate. They uh, fairly conform to GAAP. They essentially are going to issue an opinion, right? There's four types of pin opinions. Uh, it's basically like good or bad, right? So it's like an unqualified clean opinion, right? You can have a clean with a sort of associated paragraph. You could have qualified or adverse. Okay, so let's 
So continuing here, right, let's kind of talk a little bit about these. So we said there's potentially four uh, opinions they can issue, right? The first one here is unqualified or clean. Basically what's going on is we're saying these financial statements are good, right? They're fairly presented in conformity with GAAP. Um, and it's kind of like, this is what you want, right? If you're the company, right, you hire the auditor to, to uh, audit your financial statements. Why do you do this? Well, if you're a big company, you're required, right? If you want to be traded, publicly traded, you must have audited financial statements. If you're a smaller company, it's normally because you want to get like a bank loan or something, right? You go into a bank, uh, they want audited financial statements. This is when you go and you hire your auditor. This is what you want, a clean or unqualified opinion. Uh, the other one you could have is a clean with an explanatory paragraph, right? So this would be like you have a secondary paragraph. And there's kind of sort of secondary minor issues. Uh, it's not going to make it like super bad, but you still want to disclose it. This is like, it's kind of like the first one is an A plus and this is like a B plus, right? It's like still good, but uh, there might be a little area we need to emphasize. What you don't want, right? is a qualified adverse or disclaimer. And these essentially say you screwed up the financial statements. These are not fairly presented in conformity with GAAP. Uh, you know, we're, we're not going to sign off on it on the auditors. In other words, we'll give you this um, report which says this, but you're not getting the bank loan, right? They're not going to give it to you. Or uh, if you're on the, the uh, stock market, nobody's going to invest in you. So one of the sort of like interesting things uh, with like auditors, right, if you go into that, is there's sort of this like, it's like obviously you want to be objective and impartial, but it's like, how do you do that when these are your client and they're paying you money, right? It's almost like somebody who's like super cynical could say it's like pay to play, right? Um, right? How do you bring up an opinion to a client when they're the one paying you your bills? If you don't give them the opinion you want, you're going to lose them as a client. So that's why some countries, they actually have government auditors who do all this stuff because it sort of um, gets away from that bias. It's, it's not, like I said, I mean, obviously as a firm, you want to keep your reputation, but I can tell you in practices, there's been in times before where a client wants to do something or pushes back and, you know, I've seen the partner or somebody of importance say, well, like, we don't want to lose this client, right? So, um, again, just be aware of these situations. MCQ for you to look at there. Um, they then talk a little bit about using financial uh, information, right? The investors, the lenders, the creditors, what are they looking at, right? Basically, default and operational risk are, are very big things. Uh, we want to know, uh, is the company going to default on its debt, right? Are they going to be able to pay this money back that it owes? Because I don't want to put my company or invest in a company if they're not going to be able to pay their debt, right? That's like lending money to someone who doesn't pay their debt, right? That wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, likewise, operational risk, right? Is this company, is this going to be able to withstand everything that's going on? Right? Are they going to be able to keep making money? Right? Like, do I want to invest in Macy's or something whenever they're uh, the whole world is buying stuff from Amazon and never leaving their house? Right? It, it might not be a good idea to uh, invest in a brick and mortar company. Uh, likewise, whenever we have sort of uh, investors, lenders, creditors, we do set up and tee up these financial statements in such a way for them to look and compare internally and externally. So internally, right, we will normally produce comparative financial statements. So this is why you may see like year one, year two, right? If you look at like your balance sheet or your income statement, right? So maybe cash in year one, we had a hundred bucks. Now we have 120, right? It lets us compare from year to year. And sometimes it's like year one is on the left, year two is on the right. It, depends on the format of the financial statement, uh, but it lets us compare internally there. We have horizontal and vertical analysis. So again, each item like cash, uh, that could be presented from a horizontal analysis as a percentage of a base year amount or a percentage of total, right? So, hey, 
uh, how much has our cash gone up from year one or another year, right? From a base year. Likewise, what, how much of our cash um, is a percentage of maybe our total assets, right? And we use, uh, right, and this is kind of where we're going next, is ratio analysis to help us compare, right? The way you can think of ratio analysis, right, so there's just an MCQ you can look at, uh, is we're really trying to get at what's going on here and assess different things, right? It's like if you're drafting a fantasy football player, right, there's different things you care about. I want to know how many touchdowns they have. I want to know how many receiving yards they have. I want to know how many defensive, uh, I don't know, fumbles they recover, right? There's different things you're kind of getting at or trying to assess to compare, right? Because it's my pick. I need to pick which player I want to invest in um, for it. And one of the simple things they do, at least with like quarterbacks, right? Now they have that like QBR rating, the quarterback rating. And somebody like Patrick Mahomes may have 120 quarterback rating. I don't know why it goes above 100. That drives me insane, right? <laughs> Like when people are like, I'm going to put 110% into this. Me as the accountant, I'm like, 100 is the maximum. But uh, you're right. If you have a QBR of like 120 versus like a rookie quarterback who isn't good, he may have a 70, right? It lets you compare. You don't have to be a football genius to know that, uh, hey, the 120 person is better than the 70, right? It's, it's kind of an offhand way to let you compare. Uh, similar thing here with ratios, right? We're getting at different things. The first ratio we're looking at or liquidity ratios. Remember, we said liquidity is how quickly you can convert something to cash, right? So we got the current ratio and the quick ratio, right? You're going to want to look at those there. And they're really getting at um, what is going on, uh, what is the ability of the company to pay its short-term debts, right? A couple things with ratios. There will be questions on the exams. How I could test you on it is one of four ways. Right. I could ask you, what is the ratio? Right. Like the actual sort of ratio itself. I could ask you, what is the ratio getting at? Right. What are we trying to assess? I so it's like one, two, uh, three is I could have you calculate the ratio. Right. I could give you some information and you got to solve for the ratio or a, another missing puzzle piece. Or four, I could ask you how the ratio changes from one period to the next, right? If year two, right, if our current ratio in year one is 1.5, and then in year two, we buy more assets, right, our numerator goes up, how does this affect the current ratio? Will doing this increase or decrease the ratio? And generally, any ratio right, the general rule, and this is just a mathematical principle, when you have a ratio, if you make the numerator go up or the denominator go down, if either of those two things happen, the ratio goes up, right? So you can think of it just like draw a line. If that happens, the ratio goes up, right? If we buy more assets, if we uh, have less liabilities. Now, you got to do it on a net basis, right? Like, you know, if it's overall more up than down, uh, then it's overall up, uh, or it could be independent, just a single transaction just went up or not having anything that goes down. But if that's true, right, if that makes it go up, that's all you need to know. If the reverse happens, it's the reverse, right? If the numerator goes down or the denominator goes up, then the ratio goes down. Okay, working capital, right? It's your current assets minus your current liabilities, right? Another way of looking at, are we able to pay off our short-term obligations? And it's really our, our working capital, right? It's like what's left over that we can use to work with and run the business. So they're giving you an example there, right? Here's the current ratio. Uh, they're basically taking those current assets over the current liabilities. Hey, it's 2.48. The quick ratio, right, uh, the numerator is going to basically be your cash, your short-term investments, and your receivable. They're known as quick assets. 
So it's different from, right, when you're talking about this, right, this is going to be your cash, your short term, and your account receivable. So it's like, um, you know, the current ratio, but it's a little bit more specific there. Uh, so again, these are just showing you say, hey, here's what's going on in the industry. Here's what Nike is doing after we calculate it, right? It lets us compare and say, hey, Nike has a better current ratio that we might want to invest in them, right? Um, so this would be a question like a ratio question, which of these would increase the liquidity ratio? So, hey, we borrow cash by signing a three-year note, right? That's long-term. So what happens here is uh, if we look at the ratios here, right, a lot of them are the functional equivalent of current assets over current liabilities. Uh, in this case, right, our current assets go up because we get back cash, but there's not going to be any effect on our current liabilities uh, because it's a long-term debt, right? So if we have either of those, hey, the ratio goes up. All right, debt to equity, right? Next, we're moving into sort of these solvency ratios, right? Solvency is more looking at long-term debt. Liquidity ratios is short-term. So we got the debt to equity and the times interest earned ratio. You can look at those there. Again, I'd memorize all the ratios. Those are important to know. Uh, basically here, uh, the idea with it is uh, the higher the ratio, the higher the risk, right? You might not want to invest in a company that has super high debt in relation to its equity ratio. There, there, there you go, right? They're kind of running some numbers on it, uh, giving you the times interest earned ratio, right? Again, these are used hand in hand, right? They're sort of like, you know, two peas in a pod type thing that you, you would use to assess it. An example, right, you can look at that. Um, this is, you know, talking a little bit about the relationship between risk and profitability. Um, it says a company can use borrowed funds to provide greater returns to its shareholders, right? So on the one hand, you're like, yeah, I'm worried about they're not going to pay their debt. But on the other hand, if they borrow this money, then maybe they can open a new store. Or they can do this and, you know, it can, um, you know, grow and get bigger because, you know, businesses have to, um, Borrow money a lot of times to make money, right? It takes money to make money. Um, so again, you can look at that there. Essentially what they're saying is these ratios are not used in a vacuum, right? It's not a magic bullet that's going to be an end-all be-all. It's context, it's facts, it's circumstances, it's specific. It's more like one piece of a puzzle that we're going to use to help us determine if we're going to invest in the company. So here's kind of an example of this, right? So in this example, alternative two is looking a little bit better. In this one, alternative one is looking better. You can look at the specifics on that. They give us an MCQ with calculating uh, these debt ratios. And then finally on the back end here, they talk a little bit about reporting segment information, right? So what is an operating segment? Um, Normally, this would be like where you have a business, right? So maybe you have Disney, right? They have all different kind of operating things, right? They have the movies that they make, right? They have the theme parks. They have um, like their intellectual property, right? They have the TV channel. Uh, right. The idea with this, first off, is these are different operating segments. Uh, who determines this? Well, management is going to determine it. It's really based off the structure of the internal organization. Um, and as I have here, a component of a public business entity. Right. So these are components and it's formally defined by like, how would we know to separate these? Well, they engage in business activities from which it may recognize revenue and incur expenses. Uh, whose operating results are regularly reviewed, and for which discrete financial information is available. So it's really saying these are segments, right? They We can look at them almost independently. Uh, they sort of do different things, or they're a, kind of pieces that work together for our business. 
Uh, and whenever we have an operating segment, right, we have required disclosures, right? So like general information, uh, profit or loss from that segment. We got to reconcile uh, basically like the subcomponent to the like overall financial statements there, right? So this is a good example, right? Uh, hey, we have uh, business segment information for Abbott Laboratories, so some type of laboratory company. Hey, they have just like Disney different segments, right? We'll have their net sales, right? So we'll look at stuff and kind of track it within each segment. But when we foot all of this, right, this total sales is going to have to tie out to our income statement, right? That kind of like total number on there. So it's just another way of being a little bit more specific, right? When we compare the financial statements. Um, on the back end, a few kind of financial information here, reporting by geographic area. So revenues and long-lived assets, right? Uh, GAAP requires them to be reported domestically. And if you attribute them to foreign countries, likewise, major customers, right? If you have a major customer, someone who's giving 10% or more of your revenue, uh, right? You kind of have to provide more disclosure about that. Your uh, clients would, or your investors would really care about that, right? Like if you lose this one big customer, that's like your whole business, right? And it's not 10, not the 10% is like end all be all, but when you're a giant company, 10% is a lot of money, right? So you have to you know, disclose information about that uh, on there. Again, telling us a little bit difference between GAAP and IFRS with segment reporting. And with that, we're going to finish the lecture here on chapter three.